welcome. Welcome to worship this 12th Sunday after Pentecost as the heat wave resumes. A hot day today, I've been told 38 tomorrow. Uh, we're in for another one. Let us begin with our words of welcome. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is, God good. is good. In this place of worship, we are joined together <laughs> with all the people of Treaty 1 in the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We acknowledge the failures of the past, offer hope for the future, and commit to living together in peace. As we strive to walk in faith and peace with our brothers and sisters, we also pledge to create a sacred space of welcome where all people might find a home. We will we do, do our do part, our part to, see to seek reconciliation, reconciliation between, between indigenous, indigenous and non-indigenous non brothers, brothers and sisters, and sisters as we walk, walk together in peace, peace and, and harmony. harmony. We will we welcome, will welcome all, people all people as beloved, as beloved children, children, of children of God. God. Office hours will be as usual this week, Tuesday through Friday in the afternoons. Terry will be here. Uh, I will probably be here more than I have been as we come close to that time of in-person worship. Uh, but I'll also have some time working at home and you can always contact me by phone or email. A couple of announcements I want to add this morning. Uh, you will have seen in the news bits, we've had a couple of requests for delivering the paper copy of the service. We've been doing that up until now for a couple of people. We've now got a couple more. Uh, if there's anybody who would like to assist us in doing that on Friday afternoons or Saturday, uh, that would be terrific. That uh, would save Terry and I uh, doing some running around. And so we're looking for that help. Um, I will repeat the call for people to help us with operating the equipment for Rural Connect. Uh, we certainly will train people, so don't panic that you won't be able to do it. And as I mentioned, we're approaching that time where we'll once again be worshiping in person. And so there will be a board meeting this week to discuss that. Uh, if you have thoughts you'd like to share on that, please contact one of us in the next day or two uh, so we can include those in our considerations. We begin with our gathering song. Join our voices in a call to worship, and I invite you to speak when the words are in yellow, and we will call ourselves into a worship space and a time of worship. Let us say these words together. As we, As we sing and make and melody, and make melody God to God in our hearts, our hearts, in our hearts and, and with, with our, our voices, voices. Let, let us, us give thanks, thanks to God. To God. Come. Let us worship. The Spirit of Christ dwells in us to light our path. We light this candle to remind us that with Jesus dwelling in us and the Spirit walking with us, we are all children of God. We join our voices in confession. Let us pray. 
we pause, pause in our, in our celebration to remember, to remember that we that don't, we don't always, always live wisely. wisely. We don't, we don't always, always remember, remember the good things God. of God. We are, we are not, not always, always thankful. thankful. Amen. Amen. By pausing and recognizing these things, we are on the path to living differently in ways that show the unity and peace we have together in God and which reflect God's love and compassion for ourselves, for each other, and all God's people. Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also also with you. Our opening hymn is Come We That Love. Let's join our voices in song and make a joyful noise. pray. Holy One, whose word existed before we were created to hear it, bless us with a spirit that can receive your word and in the receiving to know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from the first book of Kings. As we continue the story we've been hearing over the past several weeks of David's journey, and today is the final chapter in that. David passes away, and we hear some information about his successor, his son, Solomon. Hear these words. 
Then David slept with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. The time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his kingdom was firmly established. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David. Only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used, a, used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil, for who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the, for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall rise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. If you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. We have an anthem. We had the opportunity in... Uh, I think June to record this. So thank you to Sharon, Eleanor, and Cliff. Let's listen to Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Are you tired of the bread of life yet? 
We continue our reading of John 6, and we begun this with, with of course, the feeding of the 5,000 and all of the things that come after it. We have one more week next week. This week is perhaps the most difficult of the readings. It will challenge us to hear these words. They are disturbing, but they are important. So let's hear what John has to say, what Jesus has to say about the bread of life. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh, flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. We come to know God because the Holy Spirit breathes life into Scripture. Thanks, Thanks be God. to God. Thanks be to God. After those difficult words, we have a gift of music. Victoria plays for us romance composed by M. Mayer. Let us listen.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Eating flesh and drinking blood? Wow. Definitely not one of my favorite readings in Scripture. Were you repulsed? I know I was. We've spent the last three weeks reading from the sixth chapter of John's Gospel. It began with the feeding of the 5,000 and has continued with the theme of Jesus as the bread of life throughout the verses that follow. Next week, we continue with the final part of this story. People often want to associate this story with the familiar story of the Last Supper, Last Supper and the institution of communion. But that story happens in the Synoptic Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It does not happen in John. In John, the story of the Last Supper begins at the end of the meal with Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Jesus then teaches the disciples and prays for them. This takes five full chapters in John's Gospel. There's no breaking of the bread or lifting up the cup. The closest we have is the breaking of the bread we heard at the beginning of this chapter. There, Jesus performs the familiar action of taking the bread, blessing it, and sharing it. There's no cup of wine, only fish. So while there are things here that sound like what we do in communion, and it's probably not wrong to make these connections, I don't see that as the primary focus of these verses. If instituting a rite, a ceremony, is not what Jesus has in mind, what is he really trying to do here? Perhaps he's trying to shock the people into really listening. I know it shocked me. But while I was repulsed, the group John refers to as the Jews doesn't seem to be shocked or repulsed at the image. If there is shock, it is in last week's reading when they complain that Jesus said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. This week we hear them ask, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? That doesn't sound like shock or revulsion to me. It reminds me of Nicodemus, when Jesus tells him that he must be born from above, responding by asking about crawling back into his mother's womb to be born a second time. Maybe they don't understand what Jesus is saying, but immediately they twist his words by trying to take them literally. Whatever we may think of these words, there is no doubt Jesus does not mean them literally. Nowhere, including the Last Supper, do the disciples or anyone else eat Jesus. When he is taken down from the cross, he is entombed, not cooked. What then does Jesus mean by this metaphor? I'd like to try out some ideas. You're welcome to ponder them, and if you feel they are a stretch or just don't fit with what you heard, reject them. I think passages like this invite us to ponder, to reflect, and to think deeply about what we believe and how Jesus calls us. The first connection I would like to make is John to John 1.14, where it reads, And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory. When the, connecting those words to Jesus' references to eating his flesh in this passage, I find new meaning in the phrase, eat your words. Are we to eat the words of Jesus, the word of God who entered this world as a human being? Perhaps. And what of the repetition? Twice, twice Jesus says, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood. The first time he follows it with, have eternal life. The second time he follows it with, abide in me and I in them. I wonder if we can join those two ideas. Maybe if we can get past the imagery, 
The outcome is that we live with God both here and now and in the life to come. We walk with Jesus. We abide in him and he in us. We live the life we are called to. And then there is the blood. Aside from the verses we read today, blood is only mentioned twice in John's gospel, and there's no connecting it to wine. It is mentioned when it pours out of Jesus on the cross after the soldier spears him. And it is mentioned in John 1, in verses 12 and 13. It reads, But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. Metaphorically, Blood offers two images that are, I think, relevant here. First is the idea that blood represents life. When we receive the word of God, when we metaphorically eat the bread of his flesh and drink his blood, we are receiving life in Jesus the Christ. The second is, in many traditions, blood represents family. Maintaining the bloodline was viewed as important. This is why all the rules about, around sex were so important. A man needed to know a child was his blood, his biological family. They were his own flesh and blood. Remember that saying? When I read those verses from John 1, I can't help but think about drinking the blood as meaning accepting our role as children of God. Well, that is a lot to chew on. Sorry, couldn't resist. I want to say a few short words about the reading from 1 Kings. We hear about the death of David and Solomon, and Solomon ascending to the throne. We are familiar with the image of Solomon as a wise king. Probably the most familiar story of his wisdom is settling a dispute between two women over who is the real mother to a baby. I'm going to add a comment in here before I go on, because Solomon in the reading talks about David's righteousness and David's following of God. And we know that David did some things that probably don't fit that image. But David, throughout his life, even when he did those wrong things, continued to worship God, continued to pray to God, continued to follow God even in his failings. And I think that's important to note because it's hard otherwise to reconcile those two images of David. And so Solomon will have a similar story. In the reading today, we hear about Solomon asking for wisdom. I think the fact he asks for it probably indicates that he already has at least some wisdom. At this point, Solomon follows in the footsteps of David, who, with notable exceptions, worships and follows God. Yet later in the story, Solomon falters. He starts to become political, marrying to solidify relationships with other countries. Then he builds temples for those wives to worship the gods of their countries and eventually does so himself. Ultimately, Solomon's actions are what lead to the breakup of the people of Israel into what will later become Judah and Israel. Israel is the other 11 tribes, some of which will eventually become Samaria. Well, what does that have to do with the gospel lesson? I think that it equates wisdom with the abiding in God, worshiping God, being children of God, and that is where true wisdom lay. We are called to receive the word of God in scripture and in human form in Jesus. We are called to accept that we are children of the living God. We are called to walk with and abide in God and invite God to abide in us. We are called to be the flesh and blood of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our stewardship moment, our minute for mission, is titled Converting Space for a Field Hospital in Cuba. 11 million people live in Cuba. 
By mid-July, the country had a staggering average of over 400 confirmed COVID-19 cases per million residents daily, double the world average and more than any other country in the Americas for its size. Coupled with the continuing and strengthened US economic blockade, Cuba is now experiencing dire economic conditions and shortages of food and medical supplies. The dramatic surge in cases related to the Delta variant has been most acutely, felt most acutely in locations such as Cardenas and Matanzas, where mission and service partners, the Christian Center for Reflection and Dialogue and the Evangelical Theological Seminary are located. When hospitals in Cuba were pushed to capacity, both partners moved quickly to convert their buildings to help. Today, both the Christian Center for Reflection and Dialogue and the Evangelical Theological Seminary are being used as field hospitals and isolation centers for children and their families who have been exposed to the virus. At Evangelical Seminary in Matanzas, a team of doctors and nurses attend to 120 children and their accompanying parents, as well as other individuals who are suspected of having or are diagnosed with COVID-19. Seminary staff work to support the hospital, including providing food for the hospital on a daily basis. This generosity in action is also inspiring others to be generous too. Local business owners and the public have begun to donate food, transportation, masks, and more to the Christian Center for Reflection and Dialogue. In recent days, we have welcomed representatives of different businesses in the city to our institution with special contributions. Cake, ice cream, jam, and graphic prints with hopeful messages, says the Center in a report calling the groundswell of kindness gratifying. Throughout the pandemic, your support through mission and service has helped provide vital personal protective equipment, shelter, and food for people in Canada and around the world when they need it most. Now, it is also providing life-saving vaccines. Thank you for all the ways you are making a difference. The Spirit gives the gift of life lived in Christ Jesus. Let us offer our gifts that the good news of Christ be shared throughout creation. In this time of social isolation, gifts of money can be dropped off at the church or given electronically through e-transfer, pre-authorized remittance, or CanadaHelps.org. We sing together our offering song, and we pray. Gracious God, may the various gifts we bring, our time and our skills, our relationships and our care, and our money that is a token of all we offer you, be used for good. Grant understanding and discernment to those who give, those who distribute, and those who receive, so all are used wisely for your works, we pray. Amen. I begin the prayers of the people this morning with the words of Psalm 111 as they appear in Voices United. They read as a prayer and I think an appropriate one for today. So let's pray. I will thank you, God, with my whole heart in the company of the upright in their assembly. Great are your works, O God, studied by all who delight in them. Honor and majesty are your work. Your righteousness endures forever. You have won renown for your wonders. You are gracious and full of compassion. You give food to those who fear you. You keep your covenant always in mind. You have shown your power in action, giving your people the heritage of nations. The works of your hands are faithful and just. 
All your precepts are trustworthy. They stand fast forever and ever, grounded in justice and truth. You sent redemption to your people. You decreed your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Those who practice it have good understanding. May your praise endure forever. God who is word, God who abides, God who is our very flesh and blood, we offer to you praise and prayer. We thank you this week for the rain that has come, the rain that has refreshed the earth around us, that is much needed and continues to be needed. Give us the wisdom that Solomon asked for and the compassion and love of Jesus that can put wisdom into our daily living. May we always turn to you in times of sorrow and in times of joy, in times of suffering and times of freedom. We pray today for the people of Haiti as they suffer another devastating earthquake. We pray, pray this week for the people of Afghanistan as violence once again it seems to be the order of the day. As we near the start of the Paralympics, we pray for the athletes, the volunteers, and the people of Japan challenged to host this event during a pandemic. We pray this week for Michael Kovrig, Michael Spavor, and Robert Schellenberg as they continue to suffer while countries play politics with their lives. We pray for people suffering the consequences of human-created climate change, especially people experiencing wildfires and extreme temperatures. We pray today for ourselves and those in our community who need your healing touch. We pray for Marcy Day, Kim Wilkie and family, for Heather, Allison Shepherd, Alice and Ian Patterson, for Harry DeLorme, Kim Sisa, Emma, for Rob Somerville, Ken Weens, Sherry, Beverly Green, for Susan Funk, Linda Rogers, Shelley Dan, for Marlene Hindman, Earl Yetman, Robert Ackerman, and Mary Zagonchuk. We pray for Sophie Herman, Don Griffiths, Tina, and Kirsten Marie, for Kendall Lyle, Sarah Taplin, Carol Manzi, for Pat Schwartz, Shirley Squires, Amanda Kafka, and family, for Judy Rittinger, Selma Bealby, Harold Bala, for Marion Moulter, Delilah Kurlak, Bailey Howard, Doug Lishka, for Debbie Medeiros and family, and Donna and Lyle Taylor and family. We pray for those who grieve. We pray for the family and friends of Catherine McLeod. May they find comfort in your love, O oh God. We take time now to pause and allow each of us individually to offer prayers, silently or out loud, for people and situations near to our hearts. As part of the Prairie to Pine Regional Council prayer cycle, we pray for Selkirk United Church. And as part of the World Council of Churches prayer cycle, we pray for the people and lands of Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali, Mauritania, and Niger. As we pray for healing, wholeness, and holiness, turn our prayers from words into actions. Bless our journey, we pray. We continue to pray, saying together the words Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn, All Praise to Thee, let us sing.
into the week ahead. Let us be careful, joyful, and wise. Let us make the most of our time and give thanks to God. Go out to share the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the sustaining fellowship of the Holy Spirit this day and always. Amen.